Well, well, well. Well, are y'all ready for this? I hope you're ready for this. So, what amazing speakers that we've had. And I think it would be uh, just an honor. Would you give them a great big God bless you? Let them know how much you appreciate them. Such an honor to be with you again. Uh, in our last session, I taught you about prophetic cycles. I talked about biblical cycles, scriptural, spiritual cycles, but also secular cycles. One of the things I brought to your attention was the, the um, similarities between Abraham Lincoln, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. Y'all remember that? How many remember every detail? Okay, that's what I thought. I just thought I'd check it. Uh, I'm going to see if I had any liars in church, whether I need to give an altar call here in a minute or not. But uh, anyway, I, I brought up the possibility of some kind of prophetic cycle with Robert Kennedy Jr. And I told you to be aware that the spirit of assassination is on the loose. While I was teaching, I want to show you what just happened. They've got a graphic they're going to put on the screen behind me. Armed man posing as a U.S. Marshal arrested at Robert F. F. Kennedy Jr. event in Los Angeles. He had two guns. They were loaded. He was there to kill him. He was posing himself as a federal agent. Would you like to know where this just happened today? At a theater. At a theater. If you guys aren't awake now, somebody needs to hit you in the head in the bat with a bat and speak in tongues while they do it, right? Come on, everybody look at your neighbor and say it's time to wake up. In fact, I want everybody to do this one more time. Stand up real quick, stand up real quick. I want you to find two people and tell them you're setting by the best looking thing you've seen all day long. Come on, tell them you're setting by the best looking thing you've seen all day. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, be seated. Now ask the Lord to forgive you for lying. I want to leave you with a word. Now, I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to lay my ears back and preach. So that's just, I'm just going to have church with you now. My problem is I'm, I'm, I'm preacher, teacher, so I'm a treacher. I don't even know what that is, but I'm sure it's in the Greek somewhere. In my last session with you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on a subject of lights out. Lights out. And in this session, I'm going to talk about taking back spiritual territory that has been lost in our culture. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse number 2, the prophet Isaiah says, Behold... The darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. I want to look at that verse again. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. We are living in this time right now when darkness is covering the earth and gross darkness is upon the people. But I've come to Pace, Florida today to let you know that God has a prescription for the darkness. Would you like to know what it is? Here it is. The Lord is going to arise upon you and his glory is going to be seen upon you. God is about to do something in the body of Christ to push back the darkness of our culture. Come on, somebody say amen to that. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 14, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. They don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everybody who's in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Come on, shout that out with me. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There was a ragtag Jewish force that fanned out across a hill 12 miles outside of Jerusalem at a place called Adassa. It was comprised mostly of farmers and priests and craftsmen, poorly armed 
And they numbered no more than just a few hundred people at best. Their leader was a rural priest named Judas Maccabeus. He was known to all of his followers as quote unquote, the hammer. He looked out across this jagged valley at Adassa at a well-trained forces of the Seleucid Greeks. The Greek general Nicanor and more than 9,000 battle-hardened soldiers were arrayed against these Jewish rebels. The year was 161 BC. This impending battle had been triggered by some of the Jews' refusals to be Hellenized, which means to be absorbed into the culture, to be absorbed into the culture. Come on, say that with me. To be absorbed into the culture of the conquering Greeks. You see, the Greeks worshiped many gods, but the Jews only worshiped one. The Greeks had a very loose moral code. The Jews had a very strict, detailed moral code. It was an irreconcilable clash of worldviews. The final straw had finally come a few weeks earlier when the Greek, Greek emperor Antiochus Epiphanes erected an idol in the holy temple. And he demanded that every single Jewish priest sacrifice a pig on the altar in the most holy place and that all of the priests bow down to the idol that he had erected. At that time, the priests finally found out who was willing to commit this abominable sacrifice. Judas killed the priest who was willing to do this on the spot. He then took a hammer, and I love this part of the story, he smashed the face of the idol, earning himself the nickname, the hammer. Then he fled into the hills with his small band of resistors. The valley that now stood between Judas Maccabeus' men and the Greek army was the very one that Joshua had used 13 centuries earlier to pursue the fleeing Amorite kings into the battle of Gibeon. And perhaps it was this memory of that glorious God-given victory that filled the rebel hearts with courage because they poured down the hill that day into the battle. And before the sun had set, the Greek force had been defeated and been scattered. General Nicanor had been amongst the first people, amongst the thousands of Greeks to fall and die that day. I want you to know in this last session, for the next few minutes, I intend to be a hammer in the hands of the Holy Spirit to smash the idols of our culture and to turn the hearts of every single person in this room back toward God on fire, believing him for another great awakening in America one more time. In the midst of a culture that is calling for you and I, Christians, to turn our lights out and let the darkness prevail. I am prophetically calling for every single born again child of the Most High King to turn your lights back on. Hear me, child of God. In the 18th century, a generation fought for America's independence from British rule. In the 19th century, a generation fought to preserve the union from those who would tear it asunder. In the 20th century, a generation fought to defend democracy from the forces of tyranny and oppression in both Europe and the Pacific. But in the 21st century, this generation will have to fight for the preservation and the propagation of a culture that is based on truth. Hear me today. Turning our backs on the culture is a betrayal of a mandate and our own heritage because it denies that God is sovereign over all of life. There are people right now who say that we just need to give up on America. But I'm telling you right now, nothing could be deadlier for the church. Nothing could be more ill-timed for the nation to the, abandon the battlefield now is to desert the cause. The belief in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ who promised you and I that he would pour out his spirit on all flesh in the last days and that our sons and daughters would experience a mighty move of God in their generation. 
You and I cannot give up our hope. We cannot give up our appeal to heaven for God to do what he said that he would do in our day. So in this dreaded day of darkness covering the earth and gross darkness covering the people, as Isaiah the prophet proclaimed, what do we got to do? What do we have to do in, this, in the middle of a culture that has gone mad? We've got to turn our lights back on. Come on, somebody shout, turn the light on. Turn it on in the church house. Turn it on in your house. Turn it on in the school house. And for God's sake, whatever we got to do in 2024, let's turn the light back on in the White House in Washington, D.C. again. Come on, somebody shout yes in this house. Now make no mistake about it. There are many who are on the other side of the debate that hate you and I. They despise everything that you and I stand for. But regardless of their hatred, our biblical mandate is to love and to bless them in return. We are mandated by the scripture not to compromise, but to challenge them. Even argue for the superiority and the accuracy of our worldview, a Christian worldview. And here's the reason we're mandated to do that. Hear me well today. Because when worldviews collide, nations hang in the balance. And that statement right there is where the source of warfare, even spiritual warfare, is happening in our culture. Competing worldviews. Now, why are worldviews important? Because worldviews are pertinent to every person's life. The way we think, the way we act, and because virtually all worldviews promise salvation and utopia to some degree, then what we need to do is we need to make sure we understand the worldviews of our culture. In his book, Future Shock, Alvin Toffler described them worldviews as the mental models for the world. So what I want to do for the next few moments is I want to talk about some worldviews. Child of God, listen to me today. When the singer-songwriter Sheryl Crow refers to the, the expected U.S. invasion of Iraq years ago, and she says something like this, Quote, and I'm quoting her now, I think war is based in greed and there are huge karmic retributions to follow. I think war is never the answer to solving any problems. The best way to solve problems is not to have enemies. Cheryl Crow, by her statement, is giving you insight into her worldview. When the late scientist Carl Sagan declared, and I quote, the cosmos is all there is over, or all there will ever be, he is making clear the cornerstone of his worldview. When Peter Singer, the current holder of the prestigious uh, Ira DeCamp prof professorship of, uh, and, and bio, of, of bioethics in uh, Princeton University writes, and I quote, human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time, that they're not persons, and I quote, and then he goes on to write that animals are self-aware, but not babies. And I quote, that light, the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or even a chance, chimpanzee, end quote. He is revealing everything about his worldview. Now, why is all of that important? Because most Christians don't know or understand the conflicting worldviews with the biblical worldview. They don't comprehend that people behave because of belief. So here's the real question today. The real question out of all of what we heard is, are our worldviews based on accurate assumptions or false ones? Child of God, do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe it? To such a degree that it determines that you will make a stand in the middle of a world that has lost its way. Worldview is destiny for individuals and for civilizations. I wanna say that again. Worldview is destiny for individuals and civilizations. But at the most basic level, at the core of every worldview 
is this desire for a better world, a utopia. I wanna do something that they probably did in high school for you, but they didn't really explain it to you. I wanna talk about a few worldviews that all of us in this room are dealing with right now. First of all, humanism. What is humanism? Now we're gonna talk about the worldviews that's guiding all the madness that we've been discussing with you over the last few sessions. One of them is humanism. Humanism is simply in basic definition, man equals God. Say that out loud with me, please. Man equals God. Now by their own definition, humanists are those who believe in the primacy of a human being. I think it's incredibly contradictory that a humanist does not value the life of a baby. But they believe in the primacy of a human being. The original Humanist Manifesto, which was written in 1933 by Unitarian Minister, Minister Raymond Bragg, in the original Humanist Manifesto, here's what he wrote, and it's gonna be on the screen for you. Today, man's larger understanding of the universe, his scientific achievements, and deeper appreciation of brotherhood have created a situation which requires a new statement of the means and purposes of religion. Such a vital, fearless, and frank religion capable of furnishing adequate social goals and personal satisfactions may appear to many people as a capable or as a complete break with the past. While this age does owe a vast debt to the traditional religions, it is nonetheless obvious that any religion that can hope to be a synthesizing or dynamic force for today must be shaped for the needs of this age. To establish such a religion is a major necessity of the present. That statement, ladies and gentlemen, right there, just described for you why the spirit-filled church in America has turned seeker-sensitive. Why it has abandoned its conviction. Now, humanists, all, all, although overwhelmingly atheist or agnostic, are not a people without a Messiah. For a humanist, their savior is humanity itself. As the Humanist Manifesto number two declares, humans are responsible for what we are and what we will become. No deity, and I'm quoting here, no deity will save us. We have to save ourself. The humanist says that the universe is self-existing, not created. As a result, man is a part of nature and has emerged as a result of a continual process. And as a result of that, watch now, quote, Science is the only proper tool for understanding who we are and our part in nature. So we all just need to follow the science. Sila. All of that is based in humanism. Humanism, again, is the doctrine of man equals God. It is the deification of man and, or, and the humanization, humanization of God. But that's not the only thing that's driving our culture. The second thing that's driving our culture is Marxism, or also known as statism. Marxism, by definition, is the government equals God. And you say, what are you doing, Pastor Shane? I'm describing and defining for you why all the mess that we're seeing right now around the world, but specifically in America, I'm, I'm giving you the basis for it. First of all, the first level of it is humanism. The second level, is a level of it is Marxism, which declares that government is God. Humanism shares a common intellectual ancestry and many common assumptions with the worldview that bears the name of Karl Marx. Karl Marx was an atheist long before he was a socialist or the ideological father of modern communism. In fact, his rejection of God was the starting point and the foundation of everything else that he came to espouse. Marx gave his name to a radical form of socialism that rejects, rejects the notions of the ownership of all private property, free enterprise, and the denial of all personal responsibility, all of which capital, capitalism is built upon. 
And so Marxism saw himself as a champion for the poor and the exploited working class. With the conviction of a prophet, he believed natural and economic forces were moving history toward a predetermined end, a series of upheavals and revolutions that would result in the di uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, Marx saw foresaw utopia. He foresaw a paradise on earth in which there would be no extremes of poverty or wealth, no rich ruling class, and each person's labor would be filled with purpose, dignity as they serve the greater collective good of society. Now, to Europe's millions of hardworking poor in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, particularly in places like the Tsarist Russia, they all look pretty attractive on paper. But of course, Marxism, hear me, has not worked, not in one single society. It is, it is conservatively estimated that in a mere handful of decades, more than 20 million people in the former Soviet Union died in Lenin and Stalin's political purges, government-induced famines, and infamous gulags. In China, as Mao took Marxist theology and used it as a roadmap for a cultural revolution and the great leap forward, it is upwards of 60 million people starved to death and were killed. In Vietnam, more than 850,000 people died in re-education camps after the withdrawal of the American military presence and Marxism came in. Did you know that recent research has estimated that 20, uh, 20th century victims of communism at more than 100 million people in number? Child of God, if you think the government is the answer to all of your problems, if you think the government is God, I've got some bad news for you. Your help is not coming from Washington, D.C. It's not coming from a Democrat. It's not coming from a Republican. You can't bet on a blue, a, a blue donkey or a red elephant. If you need help, you're going to have to put your faith in God. The government is not going to bail you out. It's only going to kill you if you let it. Come on, somebody shout, the government is not God. But this is the mindset of a generation right now. That's the reason we're raising up a generation of people in America and teaching them that you don't have to work and that you can stay home and somebody else's responsibility is to take care of you. But that is a lie from the pit of hell and it will only enslave the masses. Come on, we gotta tear down that idea of Marxism. And then there's a third worldview that's right now killing our nation. Here it is, materialism and naturalism. Now materialism and naturalism is the cosmos is God. Our world is morally upside down. We call good evil, come on now, and evil good. We preserve nature and go out of our way to do it, but we have no problem aborting millions and millions of babies. We have developed technology to build strong, solid houses, but we cannot seem to build strong, solid homes. We are building weak, sick families. We are smarter in this generation, but we are not wiser. We know more, but we understand less. We go faster, but we go nowhere. We have conquered space, but our habits have conquered us. We rescue whales and the whooping cranes, but we, we neglect and abuse our own children. We, we espouse uh, 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 caring for humanity, but right across the border, we watch, uh, we watch uh, the cartel rape little girls and take them and sell them into child slavery. Something is wrong in America right now because we think that the cosmos is God. I'm gonna preach whether you wanna hear it or not. When philosophers and theologians talk about materialism, However, they're referring to a belief system that claims the material universe is all there is. In other words, there's no unseen spiritual realm. I'm talking about churches right now in America. Don't even talk about the spirit realm at all. 
They act like the natural realm is more important than the spirit realm. Is anybody in here listening to what I'm trying to say? When Carl Sagan was making a confident profession of materialism, he noted, and I'm quoting here, the cosmos is all there is or ever was or ever will be. Carl Sagan's statement seems to be deliberate mirror of the Bible's triple declaration that God, watch now, the Bible's triple declaration that God is he who is, who was, and is to come. In mimicking the biblical language about God, Carl Sagan was pointing uh, us to a key aspect of materialistic worldview. He was saying, don't look for God or anything else outside of a physical, measurable, scientifically comprehensible universe because that's all there is. And ladies and gentlemen, what I just quoted to you, what I just shared with you under materialism and the cosmos equaling God is what is being taught right now through evolution to every single one of your children and my grandchildren in the public school system. They are re-educating the minds of this generation not to believe in a God at all. You better pray that the Holy Spirit does what God promises he would do. He would come upon your children and turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the heart of the children back to the power. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise in this room. I'm trying to press here. Here's the fourth worldview that's got us in a mess. Postmodernism and nihilism. Yeah. Now this is whatever equals God. Have you noticed how this thing kind of just declines as we go downhill? The word postmodernism obviously implies that we are post or beyond the area of modernism. The modernism referred to is that brief period of rapid innovation and discovery at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. It was the time in which it seemed that science and reason would solve every problem, overcome every challenge, and make heaven on earth if it was possible. It is characterized by earnest, optimistic faith in the inevitability of progress. Postmodernism thinking is generally characterized by two related assumptions. Number one, that it is possible to know what is true. Neither, it's impossible rather to know what is true. Here's what they say. Religion nor science can tell you what is real or right. We can't know anything, at least with certainty. Everything is relative. This is postmodernism. Whatever is God. Now watch. The second presupposition is that logic and reason can lead you only to what is true. In other words, you can't impose your truth on somebody else. All truth is relative and no person's truth is superior to another person's truth. So if you want to identify something, preach on Pastor Shane, I think I will. If you want to identify something, nobody can tell you that it's not true because true is only relative to you. There are no moral absolutes. This is why you frequently hear postmodernists label those of us who have biblical worldviews as intolerant because the Christian believes in something called absolute truth. It's called the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. The Bible speaks of postmodernism, rationality, uh, when it says in Romans 1.22, they profess themselves to be wise, but they became fools. It would be a foolish person indeed that would subscribe to this sort of vain babbling that there is no absolute truth. Come on, is this too heavy for y'all in the last session? The postmodern train of thought has a permanent stop at the end of the line. It is a dark place called nihilism. The American Heritage Dictionary defines nihilism in this way, an extreme form of skepticism that denies all existence. A doctrine holding that all values are baseless and that nothing can be known or even communicated. So if you want to know why your kids don't believe in anything, 
Don't know if anything is true at all because what I just shared with you is what is being taught in our public school systems right now. The rejection of all distinctions and moral and religious value and a willingness to repudiate all previous theories of morality and religious belief. This is nihilism. This is why your kids are growing up not wanting anything to do with the body of Christ because they're being taught by a system out there in the world that everything you and I believe is archaic, out of date, and baseless that it is not based on truth. And this postmodernism thought has completely infused the world of academics, even at the highest levels. My brother just got through teaching on the rapture. He's a very educated man. He will tell you in the post-secondary circles, it is a very rare thing to find a theologian, number one, who believes in the right of Israel to exist as a nation. Number two, believes in any type of rapture at all and is not a historical preterist. It's hard to find it. We are raising up preachers who will stand in pulpits and tell you that Jesus never dealt with homosexuality and would not have preached against it in his day. We are raising up a generation of preachers who will ordain other preachers who practice promiscuity, come on somebody, perversion and all kind of hellish deviancies and then they're standing up and they're spewing that onto a generation that doesn't believe in absolute truth. I'm telling you the devil is a liar and it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to take back this culture and turn the light back on. Come on somebody shout turn the light on. Let me give you one more. Here's one more fatal philosophy, New Age monism or pantheism. Oh, here's the apex. Everything is God. Everything is God. In one ditch, you have the atheistic worldviews of humanism, naturalism, postmodernism, declaring that God does not exist. Or if he does, he's not knowable. On the other side of the road, in the other ditch, you have monism and pantheism. Monistic religions and philosophies, that is, things like Hinduism and Buddhism and many of the current flavors of New Age mysticism that are passing around right now in America, asserts, watch now, that God is in everything and God is everything. All matter, energy, spirit, Everything composed of these elements are simply part of cosmic oneness. Hence, the green movement. So now, we can't drill for oil because everything is God. Mm. Help me, Jesus. As I hope you're seeing, this, is, this isn't a conflict of guns that we're dealing with. It's a conflict of ideas. Everybody look at me. What we're dealing with right now in America is a conflict of idea. It is a war of worldviews. One in which the fight that you and I are facing is for every institution, not necessarily territories. It's a fight for hearts, not heels. It is a clash of paradigms, value systems, visions of what the future ought to look like for America. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are in a war for the soul of America right now. And in the face of this conflict, the response recommended by some in the body of Christ has simply been to retreat. Their idea is if the country is determined to go to hell in a handbasket, then let it. This seems to be the attitude in most of the churches I go to in America today. 
Here's their attitude. As long as we're free to worship as we choose, who cares what these other people do in our nation? In other words, we just want to be left alone and we want to play church and we want to sing happy song and we don't care what happens. Is just leave us alone and let the culture crumble all around us. Let sin ravage a whole generation. Let tens of millions of people face an eternity without God. Folks, this retreat, circle the wagons approach in my opinion, is impossible to reconcile with the revealed world, word of God and with the revealed heart of God. But yet, the church has been in retreat. Well, I just got news for everybody in this room and for those of you watching me online. I refuse to participate in the retreat. Come on, do I have anybody in Florida who will say with me, I don't care what the devil has done in my culture. You can't run me off. You can't stomp me out. I refuse to participate in this retreat. I'm going to rise up and take my generation for Jesus. Somebody shout yes. yes. Sit down. I'm almost done. For far too long, we have surrendered the great universities the historic talent pools and recruiting grounds for our nation's CEOs and ambassadors and senators and presidents. We have abandoned vast stretches of the fields of art and humanities. The same is true with the varying degrees of the realms of science and business and media. So what am I here to encourage you to do today? Take it back and turn the light on. Turn the light on in the arts. Turn the light on in the media world. Turn the light on in science. Turn the light on in business. Turn the light on in education. Come on, turn the light on in politics. But for God's sake, don't let the devil have this generation. There's a lot of prophetic reasons to believe that those alive during the final days of history will see the most powerful and glorious move of God that the earth has ever witnessed. We are told that Jesus is returning, not for a defeated, cowering bride, hiding from the culture behind a calloused heart, but Jesus, my friend, is returning for a glorious church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, according to Ephesians 5:27. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, it speaks of a profoundly significant moment in which the risen and ascended Christ will take his seat of authority at the right hand of the Father. Listen to what it says. But this man, after he had once offered for the sacrifices of sin forever, he sat down at the right hand from God, of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Do you know what this passage is suggesting? That Jesus is waiting to see something before he stands to his feet. Before he marshals his heavenly myriad of angels and brings history to a dramatic and predestined close, he is waiting to see something before he stands up. Do you know what he's waiting to see? He's waiting to see a church empowered by the Holy Spirit, directed by the Great Commission, on fire with the power of the Holy Spirit, stand up in the earth and make their last final statement that Jesus is Lord and we are not retreating. He is waiting for the church to stand up and turn the light back on. You and I are Jesus' feet on earth. And it's time for us to win for Christ that footstool for which he continues to wait. Victory will not come if we remain sheltered behind the four walls of our sanctuary. It's time for you and I to quit letting the culture invade us. And it's time for you and I to go out of this room and invade the culture. We must be prepared 
to confront every false worldview in every single sphere of human activity and make the compelling argument for truth based on biblical worldviews alone. You and I must invade the sphere of influence of every area. Turn the light on. Turn it on in, ho in the home. Turn it on in religion. Turn it on in education. Turn it on in the arts and entertainment. Turn it on in sports. Turn it on in commerce and science and technology and government and politics. Come on, somebody. We have got to turn the light back on. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise right now in this room. I'm closing. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise right now in this room. I know you're tired, but I'm gonna stir you up with this last thing. There's a scripture that's been haunting me it's been keeping me up at night. Often I can't sleep because I think about this scripture. In many ways it torments my mind in a good way. It's found in Psalm 22 verse 30. Look at what it says. A seed shall serve him and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. I want you to read that out loud with me. Read it out loud like you know it's the Bible and like you know the Bible scares the devil to death. Are you ready? A seed shall serve him and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. One more time. A seed shall serve him and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Everybody focus your attention right here. I believe with all my heart that our Father is looking for a remnant of believers today who will serve as a seed for this generation. If he can find a seed willing to make the sacrifice for their peers, I believe that he can reap a harvest of an entire generation. And we will see the transforming power of God at work in every area of our culture. Now, God gave us the perfect example of a seed for a generation. He sends his son, Jesus Christ, as the ultimate sacrifice for us all. And in a similar way, he then turns around and says that you and I are seeds for our generation. The problem is, many of us have not been accounted to the Lord for our generation. Very simply put, we have refused to die. One of my favorite groups of people in history are the Moravian Christians. They were persecuted Protestants before there even was Protestants. They were a minority in Central Europe. No such thing as Protestantism, but they were Protestants nonetheless. 100 years before Martin Luther the Moravians rejected, now this is before Martin Luther, the Moravians rejected many of the abuses and the errors of Rome and pursued a simple faith of worship and charity for their generation. As a result, the Moravians were severely persecuted and they, were, they suffered great hardship. Nevertheless, they are marked by history for their extraordinary compassion, their service, and above all, their passion for souls. In the early 1700s, Moravians began coming into the new world. Some came because they were trying to escape the persecution and because they were being forced from their homes. Others were compelled by a powerful missionary impulse. For example, some saw a swelling population of slaves being transported to the colonies in the Americas and they wondered how these poor black souls would be reached for Christ. They noticed that the treatments of the slaves everywhere in the New World was appalling. But in the West Indies in particular, it was especially so. The seemingly endless supply of fresh slaves available from Africa convinced Caribbean plantation owners that they didn't need to provide any care for their slaves at all. So they literally worked their slaves to death and then they would just go out and order or buy replacements. It was this group of shackled and shamed humanity that broke the heart of white Moravian Christians and they had this desire 
to reach them. The problem is, watch now, how does one culture infiltrate another culture? They started praying, burdened about the fact that these black African slaves were gonna die and go to hell because they didn't know anything more than pantheism at the very least, serving idol gods, and they didn't know Jesus Christ. They began to pray, God, how can we take the gospel to them? Their solution was this. They would sell themselves into slavery because the only way to reach these slaves was to become one of them. On October the 8th, 1732, a Dutch ship left Copenhagen Harbor bound for the Danish West Indies and on board there were two white Moravian missionaries. John Leonard Doper, who was a potter, and David Nitschman, who was a carpenter. Both were on their way for one reason, to sell themselves into slavery so that they could reach the slaves of the West Indies. As the ship slipped away from the belly of the ship with the slaves, they looked to their friends and their loved ones who were on the dock. They stretched out their hands out of the windows of the ship and they cried a cry that would ring in the ears of future generation and Moravian missionaries. They knew that they would never, ever see their family again. They would never hug their kids. They would never embrace their grandkids. But they were so burdened that there was a culture that was lost and without God, they were willing to give it all up to take Jesus into that culture. So as the slaves' ship slipped out of the harbor, they had been bought on the auction block put in the shame shackles. They stood at the window and they released a cry that is forever recorded in history. And here it is. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Amen. They sold them so. Let me quote the scripture again. A seed shall serve him and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. What, do th what did these two white men going into a black culture, a slave culture, accomplish? Well, some historians estimate that 80,000 slaves came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the effort of these two men who decided to give up their life. What were they? They were the seeds willing to die, fall into the ground, and their king would receive the harvest of a generation. They understood what you and I have got to get in our spirit once again in the body of Christ. We are placed on this earth for a fleeting wisp of time, not to be comfortable, but to comfort. Not to be served, but to serve. Not to bring glory to ourselves, but to give God the glory that he deserves. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. What's the answer for America? I could talk to you today about a lot of prophetic stuff. I could talk about the alignment of the stars today. You know it is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And while we're sitting in this room, there is an asteroid that has not moved ever named the child. And it just moved into the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, and is in her womb. 
And tomorrow night, it will exit the womb between her legs. The virgin is giving birth to the child on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. Oh, I could talk to you about that stuff. I could talk to you about the winds, the prophetic winds that are blowing. There's four winds, prophetic winds that are blowing. There's the wind of economy, the wind of politics, the wind of religion, the wind of war. And those four winds blowing from the north, south, east, and west are creating the greatest storm of human history. I could talk to you about how we are living in the days of Noah. The days of Noah are earmarked by two things, transhumanism and violence. I could talk to you about the days of Lot, which is marked by transgenderism. Oh, we could deal with a lot of prophetic stuff, but here's the truth. We have got so much prophetic teaching in us about how the Lord's coming and all of these different events, and we've got great men of God who are traveling around and doing that, but nothing has changed. We're losing territory. We're giving up ground to the devil, and I've just come today to stir you up and draw a line in the sand and say, hell is not gonna have my generation. Hell's not gonna have my kids, my grandkids. Hell's not gonna have Pace, Florida, or Pensacola, Florida. Do I I got anybody here who will say, I'm going to turn the light on in my generation. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to become a seed for a generation to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm going to contend with heaven until God blows another wind called the wind of the Holy Ghost all across America and reaps the greatest revival that we have ever seen. Come on. Is there anybody in this room who wants that? So I leave you with these words. You can stand up with me. I'm done. Stand up with me. In John chapter 1, verse number 5, I hate to hit you and run. I really do. John chapter 1, verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness. Woo! Excuse me. I'm about to let my... I'm about to get my Pentecostal stuff on there. I was saved in the 80s. That's the sprinkler for those of you who don't know. <laughs> Keep messing with me. I'll do Michael Jackson's moonwalk. I don't care. It'll be anointed too. Come on. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. Listen. Listen. The darkness is not the problem. It's the absence of the light. Can I ask a question? How can less than 4% of the population commandeer, not a week, but a whole month, have parades all over the nation and have billions of dollars thrown to it? But yet the church of the Lord Jesus Christ who comprises two billion people out of eight on this planet can't seem to get a week of revival. I'll tell you why. Because the gays will give to their agenda. The liberals will give to their agenda. But church people won't tithe. They won't give. Until the church arises out of her slumber and turns the light on, we're going to continue to lose territory. But I got news for you. It doesn't take a whole lot of light to dispel the darkness. If I can just get somebody to take their candle out from under the bushel, put it on a lampstand, and flick the light switch on, come on, hell will go running in the opposite direction.